Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, we're going to be talking about the, uh, the the global consumer and riding the wave of the world's glow, uh, growing middle class. Um, the way we're going to do this, we're going to have a great conversation with uh, our panelists, and then uh, we're going to toss it to you. Uh, given that there are fewer of here, you here than in some sessions, you'll all have to ask three questions uh, each. But we do have a, uh, a microphone that will be going around. The only thing we ask is that it only gets recorded uh, if you speak into the mic. So even though it's a small gathering, uh, we do need everything that everybody does here to be on the microphone. So just uh, you'll, you'll put up your hand when you want to talk, and, uh, and I will go to you. Uh, I want to introduce my panelists. On my far uh, right, your left, is Mitch Barnes. He's the CEO of Nielsen. Uh, to my right is Mark Klaus. He's the Chief Growth Officer at uh, Mondelez International. Justin Leong is the Head of Strategic Investments and Corporate Affairs at Genting Group. And Vimal Shah is the CEO of Bidco Africa. Welcome to all of you. Thanks. Thank you. You, Thank you all, in your own and very different ways, have experience with the growing middle class in the world. And if you if you're from this part of the world and you, uh, you, you, you follow the news about the economy, you'd actually have the impression that there isn't a glowing, growing middle class. And in much <laughs> of the developed world, that's a fact. In much of the developed world, the middle class is under a great deal of stress uh, and, and, in fact, uh, getting smaller in some cases and getting less prosperous. But, in fact, that is so dramatically outweighed by the trend in the emerging uh, parts of the world uh, that, that companies uh, that provide services and products have really got to think this through well. In some ways, it means taking an entirely different approach to how you do business in, in more developed parts of the world. Uh, and then the complexities and the nuances of the fact that there is no such thing for a company as the develop, developing world or the emerging markets. They are all entirely different. So what I'm going to try and do today is establish some sense of trend in uh, what we call emerging markets uh, amongst the world's growing middle class. And then some of the nuances and differences between those countries and, and the things that, that companies can learn. We have some people uh, uh, here on the panel who deal with um, the world over and some people deal with narrower regions, but even within narrower regions there are uh, differences. So we want, to, we want to understand that fairly well. I'm going to start with you, Mitch Barnes uh, from Nielsen, uh, because you've done a lot of work on this and a lot of studying on this. Uh, we can't, we probably won't even agree here on what the middle class is, what this growing middle class actually encompasses. Well, it's true because the definitions vary depending on the government who's laying out the definition. And even over time, you'll find that the definitions change. And obviously, they get liberalized because governments want the middle class to be bigger and bigger to show the progress of their policy. But almost no matter how you define it, no matter how you slice it, the middle class at a global level is growing. And uh, it's largely an Asia story, at least right now. By 2030, we expect about two out of three middle class consumers in the world to be found in Asia. And um, in the short run, it's really Southeast Asia right now kind of leads the charge. Next, it'll be China, where it'll grow to about 625 million middle class consumers over the next 10 years. And then India's middle class will be the one that will come as sort of the third wave, going from around 50 million now to around 200 million by 2025. And then uh, once India's done with its uh, middle class development, Africa will be there to you know, provide yet another wave. So it's just going to come one wave after another. And that's why in the developed world, even though the middle class is not growing and uh, it is putting pressure on consumer brand marketers in the economies uh, at a global level, largely at the, uh, from the Asia perspective, middle class is still booming. Vimal Shah, you uh, do work in Africa. You're, uh, you're from Kenya. So am I, just in case anybody didn't know that. Um, you, you deal in manufacturing and consumer goods. And in fact, uh, Mitch might be right that there's a few cycles to go before Africa becomes the biggest story. But in fact, uh, on many levels, in terms of economic growth, GDP growth, Africa is a pretty big story right now. Absolutely is. And I think uh, uh, the issue there is we can talk about defining what middle class means for Africa. And it depends on your definition of bottom of the pyramid and middle. But I think the bulging middle is, is, is really emerging. Um, for us, it's, it's, it's slightly a notch lower than what you would talk about in the West. But <clears throat> today, the, the economy is, for, um, if you talk about Africa, um, the whole economy is about $2 trillion, uh, right? It's expected to go to about $4 trillion, uh, by 2025. So that's the whole economy in terms of 
Africa. Now, Africa is different segments, right? You've got to talk about North Africa, South Africa, Eastern Africa, and then West Africa and Central Africa, five regions. But um, I think when you talk about it the long, long term, the consumer is still at the bottom. The big consumer is at the bottom. And that can only go one way. It can't go worse than that. It's going to go up. And as economies are improving, as reforms are happening, the middle class is, is, is growing up. What is important is all the rest. We, you don't see the middle class in big time because a lot of the infrastructure, a lot of the other facilities, housing and all that stuff, has not kept up. And therefore, we have this huge urbanization. Uh, call it a problem, call it an opportunity. You know, depends on which side you look at it. But it's a, it's a huge problem and we've got slums coming up. Even with the slums coming up, that's a housing issue. Uh, consumption is still happening. So when you have numbers and the demographics, the consumption is still happening. People are still having breakfast, lunch, dinner. If you're poorer, you're having a, a breakfast and a lunch or a, or a dinner. Or if you're really poor, you're still having a meal a day. People are still washing up, so all that stuff is still happening. I think the consumer is still there. The point is demographics. Today we are about uh, you know, a billion people all over Africa. Um, we'll be the largest continent soon. Um, by 2050, we expect to be about 2.4 billion people. Now, wherever there are people, there's markets. And that's the way to look at it and say, fine, what are those markets? The bottom will go up and become a middle class. The uh, reforms that are happening in governments, the reforms that are happening in, 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 in systems, internet is a serious enabler today. Everybody's got access to internet, therefore they aspire to bigger brands and products. And I think that's going to be a huge, uh, uh, going forward, it's going to be a huge demand for global brands also. At the same time, there's a huge number of local players coming up. I think that's where the local products are coming up. Number two, I think the way they meet that demand is going to be different. And the way you meet demand of the middle class in the US or in, in the Western Europe is going to be different in Africa. And that middle class is lower uh, with a lower uh, per capita income, but their consumption is still happening. So I think it's going to be a different way of working on it, different way of packaging the products, and different way of presenting the products. Again, Africa is 54 countries, not one, not one um, you know, country. But at the same time, you can actually see similarities in regional economies. So Eastern Africa will be similar, Western Africa will be similar, North will be similar, and that's where you've got to really segment the market. But I think overall, the middle class is growing. It's not as growing as fast as the consumption in Asia, but it's going to grow nevertheless. Uh, and, and you know, Vimal has sort of set you up for discussions about localizing the appeal <coughs> of products, the packaging, the... Right. Uh, and, and you can talk about all of those things, but the one thing uh, you can pick up on immediately is that uh, Vimal talks about Africa being divided into five regions, generally speaking, geographic regions, but the decision by a company that's not native to, uh, to a country or region to go in may have to do with established infrastructure, whether it's trade or transport infrastructure, so, so that's influencing things. So these five regions have, have got reasons right. why you would go into one of them versus the other. Yeah. I mean, I think um, one, of the, one, of the thing, one of the criteria that we're using um, in, in evaluating where and how we enter uh, into different markets is, is really through the lens of a sustainable business model. So there's a, a variety of components that we need to have in place to reach a tipping point. And again, I, I think as, as technology advances, as we get better about using our scale, better learnings as we move from one developing market to another, it's enable us to move that timeline a little bit forward. So we're able to enter into the markets earlier than we would have in the past, but the premise is still the same. Uh, we have to have a route to market that's, that's capable of sustaining our business in a reliable way. We have to have a, a base of supplier manufacturing capability that enables us to reach price points that are going to allow that middle class to access our products. You know, one of the uh, fascinating story in when we rolled Oreo out into China, uh, there's a lot of discussion, a lot of press around the the way we customize flavor profiles to enable consumers to to have a better connection with Oreo. But the honest answer, one of the biggest. Uh, accelerators for the Oreo business was our ability to bring a smaller pack size that hit a price point that aspirational consumers were able to reach up into the Oreo brand and be able to be part of that franchise. And then as economic prosperity grew, they grow with the brand, they pick up different parts of the franchise. So in a sustainable business model, we've also got to have the packaging and the price points that allow consumers to enter our franchise earlier on in their journey and then we carry it on from 
from there. So that's a bit of how, so it's a, it's a way of describing the model and then we apply it in places like Africa to determine how and where we're going to enter, where are we in a position that we have the opportunity uh, to be successful. And at sometimes too, it could be that organically we'll never be able to do it, so we look for the right uh, acquisition. Uh, we just purchased a, a business, Kindo, in Vietnam which was an excellent example where we saw tremendous opportunity but a very difficult path for us to build that organically over time. This was an opportunity for us to accelerate that journey by using an external strategy paired uh, with a fairly What does solid. that company do? This is uh, Kindo the is the largest uh, biscuit uh, company in, oh, uh, in Vietnam. Mooncakes as well. Yeah, they have mooncakes and right. biscuits both. So I'm it's something of an expert on snack foods. <laughs> <laughs> you were, I think you're in the right neighborhood then. You had a, you, I think your title, one of your titles was the president of snacks or something, right? Uh, I, I've been <laughs> I'm short of that at Al Jazeera. <laughs> That's informal, good. Well, we, we should have a, a informal arrangement. But <laughs> no, yeah. Well, I ran Snacks for North America uh, back when we were Kraft. Uh, so two years ago That's before like the, we split. That's, that's really like the most fun job in, in America. In craft, yes. Yeah, in the world. <laughs> in the world, yes, yeah. Uh, very interesting. And, and, and I want to talk to you because Vimal has been in charge of doing it the other way around. You've actually made some acquisitions from major uh, multinational corporations. I'm going to get to that in a second because one of the things about what Mark said is, is uh, you know, adapting the Oreo to the market and creating and allowing that aspirational customer to, to become part of your brand. Your view of the aspirational customer in Asia and globally is a bit different. You, you'd like to get them into going to resorts and taking cruises. Yeah, I mean, I think the, uh, I mean, two, two points to make. One is that the when you talk about the emerging middle class, um, the tastes and the aspirations are changing dramatically quickly at the same time. So not only are they emerging, um, and whilst you think that this is a great product now, in three to five years, that product has to evolve uh, as tastes evolve. Um, the, the big trend that we see really is a, a push towards experiences. And we've seen this all over Southeast Asia, and you're now seeing that in a dramatic way in China. Um, and experiences, uh, you know, I think from, from the Asian perspective, it's all about it's always about continuous improvement and self improvement. So um, whilst you can go buy an expensive luxury handbag, that doesn't really necessarily improve yourself. But if you took that trip and you went on a safari in Africa or you went off to visit Los Angeles, you improve yourself by learning more about the world that you that you live in. So we hope, obviously, to. Uh, uh, produce or have the right sort of product that that meets those aspirations, especially the the experiences that people are looking for. And uh, th does that mean that your view of what a growing middle class is is different than what Mark was just talking about? Uh, because we, we're talking about urbanization, we're talking about people getting into experiences or the per purchase of products or services that they otherwise weren't involved in. So obviously if somebody's going to travel, that's somebody who's not worried about a single pack of Oreos. So what, I'm, what, what, what I am saying is that uh, it's moving very quickly. Got it. So you know, not only have you, I mean, if you look at China or uh, I don't know, Indonesia or whatever it is over the last 10 years, not only has urbanization taken place extremely quickly that they can afford the Oreos, but it's also resulted in the last few years that they can also travel. Got right? it. So maybe they can travel and have Oreos at the same time. So whereas yeah. the cycle in North America may have taken longer. Oh, it's significantly faster. Yeah. And you know, the one, just to build a little bit on that, that point of experience, because I, I do believe uh, that is consistent with what we're seeing in food as well. The, the, the fact that we made Oreos accessible to Chinese middle class did not mean that we cheapened the product or we changed the experience. In fact, it, it was the other way around. Had we done that, I don't think we would have been successful because uh, we would have missed the insight where that, that fact that they could buy a, a kilo of other local biscuits that they would trade off for a much smaller pack of Oreo was part of the, the recognition and the acknowledgement of progression. And whether that's individual development or whether that's just the, the belief in themselves and the confidence that comes from being able to access a global brand or to purchase something that's at a higher uh, a value position. So I, I do agree um, that it's not about cheapening things to allow access in, but about creating real experiences uh, in a way that matches wherever they are in that development cycle. But I don't want you to miss this growth, growth opportunity to put Oreos on the cruise ship. Yeah, right, I got that. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> they better be there already. Get they're, get they're on there already. All right, they're Justin, there already. Justin, thanks. What is the trade-off, uh, Mitch, uh, because we really are seeing uh, a slowdown in the growth of the middle class in the developed world, and yet there's this remarkable, I mean, everybody's outdoing each other with the growth statistics here about how exciting it is to be in Asia and India and Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, for, for established companies, is it, is it a wash? Uh, you mean in the developed world? No, but versus the losses that versus the lack of growth that you're seeing in the more mature markets. No, I, I wouldn't say it's a wash. Um, in, in fact, even in the developed world, there's still uh, opportunity. In particular, in the United States, happens to be the exception for the developed world because mm -hmm. we're still seeing population growth, and almost all of that population growth is in the multicultural segments, Hispanic Americans in particular. So um, big growth opportunity for the companies that learn uh, about those segments, reorient their brand, their marketing to those growing parts of the U.S. population, while also still enjoying the long-term tailwinds that exist in these developing markets. But that's, that's, that's the same learning, right? If you're going to tailor your established products to new demographics in the United States or North America or Europe, it's the same habit and learning that you're going to apply to Africa. Uh, it is. Different Asia. terminology gets applied to it, but fundamentally it's the same mm -hmm basic marketing challenge. And interesting thing is when you look in the emerging markets, right now, at least over the last couple of years, and sorry about this, but I think it's true, the um, local companies, companies like Bitco, for, ex for example, have generally been outperforming the global companies. They're growing faster, they're winning market share, and a lot of it's because they have tailored more to local tastes, they have been more agile, they move more quickly from the standpoint of innovation. They haven't been tempted to try to run the, the global scale cost reduction play because that's not their game. And so they've been winning market share. We're going to see the global firms recalibrate and start to become more competitive with their Let, new product innovation. Let's talk about that at Bitco. Uh, you, what, what are the th examples where you've done well versus the, the big players in Africa, Procter & Gamble, Unilever, uh, competing in the, in the products that you sell? I think principally we, we have similar products like Procter & Gamble or Unilever, but the difference has been uh, KYC, know your, cons know, know your consumer and operate at much faster speeds in terms of what they want and what they need. And I think knowing the needs of the people and then working on it and saying, fine, from inside we're going to grow bigger. Whereas a multinational like Procter & Gamble, I mean, I'll give you an example, uh, I don't want to be quoted, but Ariel There's is, nobody listening here, don't worry. Okay, fine. Okay, fine. Shh, like, yeah. like they had a detergent brand that, went, that came in and said one size fits all. It's going to be all over Africa in the same manner, same pack, and they're not going to change it. And they actually left from, from that country and said, fine, we're, we're packing up, going away. It's not a big market for them. And we're still expanding our detergents, our soaps, and our, our products going into the market. But in some market. cases, you had instances where the ad, uh, the television ad, was a, a Nigerian, and a Kenyan knows that that's not a Kenyan. Of course, everybody. In Africa, you would know this is from Nigeria, this is from South Africa. Mm. Their accents are different. We would know, but of course you wouldn't know. Um, the real problem is a lot of one-size-fits-all multinational strategies to say globally, Africa-wide, we're going to have one strategy, one pricing, one product, and then try and get the local people to try and sell it. Whereas we innovate from inside and say, fine, what do the people need here? Segment the market. Within Kenya, we would segment the market between you know, the Kisumu side and the Nairobi side and Mombasa side. And you need to segment in that manner, plus flexible manufacturing. Whereas the multinational goes mass manufacturing, big scale. Uh, you know, we do look at customization. We actually look at segmenting the market in a different way. So we serve the customer needs in a different manner. We're able to change our products the way the customer wants it, because it's dynamic. Customer preferences change all the time. That's something that needs to be done for Africa. Um, when you do that, when you go into Tanzania, you've got to speak in Swahili. You can't put, speak in English. When you go into Uganda, you don't speak in Swahili because that's not on. So you've got to understand these nuances, which is where large agencies wouldn't understand that. So marketing, selling, also distribution, points of purchase, and how you communicate with customers. Today, we do mobile commerce. All our people can buy products online, and they can pay for it online straight away, and they can buy the product. Um, I think a lot of multinationals would struggle with that. All our systems are linked to our SAP systems, which are real-time online. So that's all interconnected. Whatever a multinational can do, we can do too. Mm. We're ISO 9000, ISO 14000, 18000, 22000 certified. But so, can you do it at the same price? Uh, we can do it at a better price. Mm. 
because our overhead cost that they allocate uh, in terms of whatever it's transfer pricing or whatever it is, is much lower. Mm -hmm. we're, we're looking at it from a local perspective, so it's different. So right now we operate in Eastern Africa and we're producing in all these countries. And we actually bought over the Unilever business for, for edible oils and stuff like that because they thought they got to make bigger brands worldwide. And we said, hang on, these are brands that have legacy. If you were born in Kenya, you know Kimbo, you know, we bought that off. So when I look at that and say spend is increasing, now, just over 2000 and 2012, if I give you a statistic here, um, I think overall $850 billion have been added to the annual spend in Africa in 12 years' time. Now, going forward, it's going to become bigger. So that opportunity scale is big. Unilever actually left in, in manufacturing, and now they're talking about putting up a plant again, hmm. coming back to the countries. So I'm just saying the whole opportunity that we see it is from inside out and they see it from a global perspective. At that time when they left, Eastern Europe was very attractive, so they actually put all their money there. And I think asset allocation for a large multinational is different on a global right, scale. Right. Whereas on a local scale, we're operating there. So that's one thing. Uh, we operated at standards that are above uh, normal standards. So we are operating at multinational standards. But our speed is important. Our decision making is faster. And therefore, you're able to meet customer needs much more faster. Responsive organization, lean, Kaizen, that's what we work on. And really, it works quite well. So when you look at that, you actually create products for different markets in different sizes. When you go to the slums, you make smaller packs. Now, that product will not sell in your supermarket or modern trade. They don't buy it. You've got to have a bigger pack there. It's more attractive. Packaging is important. Marketing is important. Again, appealing in, in the right direction. So a lot of that, really. Um, a lot of people talk about scale and saying one advert fits all over Africa. It doesn't. You've got to have differences. Even the people, they recognize them. So yeah. you've got to operate differently. Again, taste preferences. If you talk about food, we're into food and hygiene products. Food preferences are different. What's a staple food in one country is not the staple in another country. If you go to Ethiopia right now, you, you, you wouldn't sell a lot more of other products. They, they use a small product called teff. That's a different grain altogether. Whereas in Kenya, it's maize. If you go to Nigeria, it's rice. So again, when, when you look at that, we've got to look at what the preferences are. I've but recently learned that, that TEF is gluten-free, which is uh, quite yes. trendy these days. Yes, it is. <laughs> but, but talking about Oreos, we have Cold Stone. We have, they have an Oreos ice cream that they present, and they have Oreos in the markets. It's available, but it's at the top of the pyramid. It's, it's only a small portion of market. Again, if you're playing in a niche market where your market is small, high-value, low-volume low product, fine, it works. But the mass market? The mass market, you've got to look and say, fine, what do you want to service? Yeah. Justin, let me ask you something. Uh, one of the points you bring up about, about the growth of the Asian middle class, you know, in the, in, the, in the more developed world, we are small nuclear family units. In America, people are, are one in many cases. Uh, that's not how Asian families work. As they urbanize and move into the middle class, is it, is it family units that are moving in, and does that affect the way you market to this growing middle class? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's maybe one big trend, uh, which is a little bit different from, from, from America and some of the developed markets, that the family units stay very close together. Uh, so, you know, the grand, you know, typically we see a lot of people who travel uh, when they go on their annual holidays, Chinese New Year, it's actually three generations, right? So it's the, um, it's the mother, father, it's grandparents, and it's children. So I think trying to cater to um, almost 60 years in, in, in difference from the eldest to the youngest is one of the challenges that um, a lot of businesses in, uh, in Asia have. So you've got a market that is rapidly evolving, rapidly changing, tastes that are changing, plus you've got multiple generations to try and, uh, try and cope with. Uh, and it's not easy. I mean, it takes uh, many years and a huge amount of capital to build a cruise ship, a resort, and you don't know that by the time that you finished it in five years' time that you've got the right product. Right, because these tastes are changing so quickly. Uh, but in general, we can uh, we can see that people do travel uh, with their families. Uh, when they travel with their, their families, what happens is they become very price insensitive. So what happens is that they're willing to pay a little bit more for the hotel room, a little bit more for the restaurant reservation, uh, to go to a Universal Studios. They're, they're willing to pay a little bit more because, hey, I'm with, my grand, I'm with my parents. How often do I travel with my parents? Or I'm taking the family on a holiday. How often do I take the family on a vacation? Um, there is an inherent sense of guilt um, because Asians tend to overwork and work too many hours and too long hours and not take any vacation. So again, that leads to the price insensitivity. 
and, and you know, right now, I think the the most the, the key thing that we find is that they're willing to pay. So they want the best experiences. They want um, the top-notch aspirations, and they're willing to pay for it. But they don't want uh, to find a knockoff product or something that's not good enough, right? If they have to travel to Los Angeles to go to the real Disneyland, they'll do that, mm. um, and they'll save up enough uh, and 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 take and bring the whole family once a year or twice a year. So I think that that you know the the family unit remains uh, an extraordinarily important part of the Asian, uh, what we call the travel pattern. Uh, if you have capital intensive things that you do like cruise ships and resorts, uh, given the changing tastes, uh, are you going to work harder at convincing your target audience that this is what a good middle class or upper middle class vacation or cruise looks like? Or are you catering the development of these hotels and resorts and cruise ships to who you think they are? This is a tricky one. Yes, so you're trying to, you're trying to get the balance. You're mm. trying to get it just right, that there's enough of an aspirational uh, component to it. So take cruising. Right? So to, China is one of the fastest growing cruise markets anywhere in the world right now, right? And so much so that the uh, chief operating officer of Carnival has relocated and is now living in Shanghai. Hmm. But um, it, when, when, when the Chinese get onto the cruise ship, they want enough of their own experiences and their own, say, food, for example, uh -huh. but enough of the rest of the world experiences too. So you're trying to balance um, the two, that they feel enough at home, uh, and yet they can have enough experience of something that's different, whether it's a Korean island or it's a, a tourist site, so that they keep coming back. So that balance is actually extraordinarily difficult, and it's, it's, it's one of the challenges that we, uh, we deal with all the time. So, Mark, let me ask you this, because Vimal talks about knowing the local flavor. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you deal with this? I mean, clearly Oreos are not a local flavor in China. So to what degree is it catering to Chinese as they need it versus telling Chinese or anybody else, this is what you want. If you're urban and you're going to be a middle class citizen right. of the world, you got to eat Oreos. Well, I, I think certainly the uh, the case for uh, local competition was made quite strongly, which I, is great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and I I would he be, didn't name your company. I would be remiss <laughs> not to uh, not to see them as uh, as formidable uh, challenges. But I I think it's a it's an excuse for multinationals uh, to to suggest that they're not capable of connecting with local um, flavors with uh, local trends, being able to bring to bear. Um, global experiences around the world, but deployed in a balance between really understanding what a local consumer is. Oreo is successful in China, and by the way, when we talk about niche, it's about a billion dollar niche in China right now. So it's uh, it's a lot bigger business. Number one cookie in China, largest cookie in the in the uh, in the country. That's and my kind of niche. Yeah, that's that's not a bad niche. Um, and the and the reality is is that um, we took a global brand but we made it a Chinese brand. Yeah. And, and that's, that's the, the magic of putting the pieces together. That doesn't mean that we fundamentally changed the Oreo, but we added elements that would be far more relevant to local consumers. For example, one of the fastest growing uh, flavors of Oreo is a green tea ice cream Oreo. Yeah. Right? That's not a flavor you're gonna find uh, down the street here in Los Angeles, but a, a tremendous adaptation of a flavor and trend that was very successful in other segments in China that we were able to bring to bear in Oreo. And we do that in a variety of ways. I, I think the other um, opportunity for us is, um, at times I find that a lot of the local companies are very, very good at adapting in real time, very quick responders. Our opportunity is to understand and jump trends two to three ahead and establish I think um, the opportunity to get there first. One of my favorite topics right now is the, the misunderstanding that health and wellness uh, is a trend that is contained in developed markets. It simply is not true. There's $30 billion of better for you packaged snacks that are sold in developing markets. And the reality is that many of the health concerns that we have, and more importantly than health concerns, the lifestyle of healthy eating is, is a very integral part of many of the cultures around the world. And our opportunity to bring products first in those segments with the, the safety that comes with a, a large global brand, with the local uh, flavors that apply to the markets that we're in, I 
I think give us an opportunity to bring what we call the power of big and small. So the power of being a big uh, company that sees the world through a variety of lenses, drilled down to a local market and making something relevant for consumers that may not just be today, but jumping a generation or two ahead. This is where we've got to stay on our game because the, the local players are so uh, strong, quick, uh, and effective at really adapting to the moment. We've got to stay a step ahead and use the strengths that we have uh, to be successful in those markets. One, th one thing to add, if I can, to this, uh, the global firms in China, <laughs> they don't have to be global firms. They can, they can have local leaders. And I find that when um, a big global company has local leaders, they'll be far more in tune with what happens in the market. When I used to lead Nielsen's business in China, when I left, I made sure I hired a Chinese person to take my role because I knew all the things that I couldn't see in the market. Mm -hmm. And those were opportunities for our company to do a lot better. So I think that's a big plus. And similarly, the local firms, one of the reasons why they're doing so well in the emerging markets is more of them are now led by leaders who used to work at a global firm uh -huh. and learned international business practices and all the powerful disciplines and now they go to that local firm they're unleashed and they're you know they're innovating like crazy and they're winning so um, you know it's it's you can have the best of both worlds if you really approach it that way. But, but since I'm losing this battle, it's 4.15 in the afternoon and I'm still talking about food. Uh, <laughs> why don't we talk about food, Mitch? You, you've done some looking at uh, into changing uh, food purchasing habits around the world. Oh yeah, we have. We, we work with all the biggest food companies in the world and uh, so we're, we're doing all that work for them and it's basically about following the consumer. And um, you know, the consumers, these days are of course looking for value. Many of them are in, in, in the emerging markets trying to move up the value chain. Aspirational it was a word that was used before. In the developing world, I'm sorry, in the developed world, it's uh, pressure on household incomes that aren't growing um, you know, as fast as the markets overall. And so they're looking for value, often uh, turning to the store brands. And so there's you know, incredible uh, variety and uh, mul multiple directions that the marketplace is going right now. And to give everybody the visibility to all those trends and uh, let, let companies uh, form their strategy and, and execute around as best they can. That's what, it, that's what we're all about. Mark, give me examples. I'm, I'm, this is fascinating to me, the discussion that we're having here about how you take this global experience and apply it successfully in local markets. And clearly you have at least one screaming success in Oreo. Uh, wh what, are success, what are failures? Mm -hmm. You don't have to name them, but give me an example of where, yeah. where that hasn't worked. Well, I can I can give you some, <laughs> I can give you some great examples. You know, one of the um, one of our first iterations of, of global uh, categories, which was uh, taking a, a view of our businesses and saying, well, gosh, if we can just pick a couple platforms and drive them globally, uh, there's significant opportunity. You know, the, this is the the biggest trap that that multinationals fall into, which is, you know, if I can get every Chinese to eat one Oreo, what a wonderful business I'll have, which is a formula for disaster. And and, you know, one of the things that we, we did not understand is the local flavor profile, um, you know, a decade ago when we first tried this, where we would launch um, products like Ritz, but with American flavors, you know, a, a, a cheese or a sour, one of my favorites, sour cream and onion uh, Ritz in China. Uh, they didn't know what a Ritz was yet, and let alone sour cream and onion. So the combination of not really understanding that local foundation is where you get in trouble. And I, I think the other area is when you expand your businesses for the sake of expansion without that sustainable business model, and you launch to all corners of China or other markets around the world without a profitable model, it's you, you end up finding yourself in a, a constant state of defense, whether you're cutting spending, whether you're cheapening the product. So figuring out how to build the Oreo that can be successful in India, which is one of the, the latest markets that's been uh, incredibly successful, or just launching into Brazil. Um, it's because we know how to build that model now, and we're not just launching with the hope of profitability in the future. So that combina combination of localizing experience with sustainable business model, that's been a combination or learnings that at times we've had to learn the hard way. Justin, let me ask you about, um, you know, when, when Vimal was talking about Africa's 53 countries and its five regions, we, we're all very excited about uh, growth in Asia, and we can often distinguish between China mm -hmm. and, and other parts of Asia. What are the nuances when it comes to uh, dealing with these countries that, that are obvious to you and maybe not obvious to us? 
there are actually quite quite substantial nuances. So I'll give you an example. I mean, Southeast Asia, Indonesia, that's a Muslim country, right? So if you have a huge tour group that comes in from Indonesia and you serve uh, a lot of pork, mm. that's going to be a huge problem. Um, the Chinese, on the other hand, love their pork. So you have to make sure that that's readily available when they visit. So, you know, I think uh, where we're located in Malaysia and Singapore, I mean, we're in a bunch of places. Um, it, uh, Singapore is obviously a very good melting pot for all these things to come together and to give people a taste of what, it, what, what, what it's like in the developed uh, world in a very sort of controlled uh, in, in environment. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the nuances between, um, you know, the Vietnamese pho uh, or the Thai, uh, Pad Thai, so a lot of these things you, you, you can see in the food, but goes much, much further, especially to the sort of cultural uh, components. Uh, it, in a way, it's, uh, it, it's, what, uh, it's what he said earlier, that it is beneficial if you grew up in that area because uh, you naturally know what these differences are. It doesn't have to be uh, taught to you. You don't have to uh, localize or try and figure it out on the run. You, you, know, you know naturally. And it's, it, the, the reason why it's not easy is because if you get it wrong, Right, these are very large numbers. You, you you can't you can't if you have a busload of two thousand Chinese tourists that that show up. Uh, literally, we've had situations where they will uh, have a sit-in. They're unhappy about something, uh, and they will sit in the lobby and not move uh, and not do anything until you satisfy them. Which means you know giving them rooms for free or a free meal. Um, and the problem with that is that you don't know how much of it is that they're really offended or whether it's they've learned from they elsewhere. They figured right? out they, they sit in might be effective. Right, right, right. And then if you relent once, they'll keep doing it. Right. Right. The next tour group will learn. And so um, you have to be quite careful of not. And then, you know, God forbid what happens on the Internet in terms of the um, uh, uh, damage that, that's made to your brand and mm -hmm. et cetera. So uh, it is, uh, it is it, it's a region. I mean, people talk about China, but, you know, China is, right. again, right, dozens and dozens of provinces and from north to south, east to west, extraordinary different in terms of culture, food, taste, weather, climate, economy. Uh, they couldn't be more different places. What are you most excited about? Because you're doing all this stuff for the biggest, most influential, fastest growing market in the world, but you have, uh, um, you're, you're breaking ground next week in yes. Las Vegas across from the Wynn. Uh, is it the old sand? The it's Echelon Place. Echelon Place, right. Then you've got the uh, aquatic racetrack in New York City. Yep. Uh, you've got the Catskills. You've got the Miami Printing Press uh, site. site that you're doing. Um, you've got a cruise line that, that caters to a lot more than Asians. So yep. what, what's, where's, how does that break down in terms of growth for your, of, of your client base? So I think what it is is that uh, travel and hospitality and leisure uh, we see as a fundamentally growing part of uh, you know, the world economy. We think that as people uh, become more educated, uh, become wealthier, uh, it's inevitable that they'll want all these different experiences. So whether that's the you know Asians traveling to the U.S. or it's Americans going to Africa or it's the Africans going to Europe, uh, we see that as a fundamentally growing part. And it's it's curiosity. Uh, you know, you could look it up on Google um, and get all the facts and figures, but you'd still want to go on that safari. Uh, so the way that we've obviously built our business is to try and be able to capture uh, our sort of fair market share uh, as people travel more. So uh, that that lends to whether that's the resort in Las Vegas to the cruise ship sitting out of um, out of uh, out of New York. And and as new places open up, um, cruising is one of the first ways that you can address a market. So look at Cuba, right? You can be pretty sure that the first um, people, well, not the first people to visit, but the first large scale tourism there is going to be via the cruise ships, mm -hmm. right? So um, as markets open up, um, it's again, it's a, it's a huge opportunity. Your, one of your biggest competitors will be Carnival, which in, in cases of people moving into the middle class or into that middle class that can afford to cruise, they're generally speaking more affordable than, than, uh, than Norwegian. Uh, you know, yes, yes, and no. I think we have also uh, tailored the product over the last uh, last five or six years, uh, owning Norwegian uh, to make it so. For example, it used to be that you had to, you know, uh, dining on a cruise ship was very regulated in terms of hours, right? You had to sit down from seven to nine, or from, you know, you had you had specific times where you could eat because the kitchen and the restaurants obviously couldn't cope with the entire ship coming into the the the, the restaurant at the same time. Uh, so what we did was to have more restaurants. 
which would mean that you know people can eat anytime they want. If you were to tell an Asian that you have to eat every day at seven o'clock, you know they'd say you're you're crazy because, as you said earlier, they're eating all the time, right? Um, so yeah, I'd be a great Asian. <laughs> That's why the so, Oreos need to be there again. I think we're yeah. <laughs> yeah. just keep Oreos. Just, just keep Oreos. So we're, we're so simple. Keep a treasure trove of Oreos <laughs> right, in, the, right, uh, right. In, in the ship. Um, let me t uh, ask you, Mitch, about e-commerce. Uh, one might get the impression when talking about uh, China in particular, India to a lesser degree, uh, that, that if you just built your business on e-commerce and did a very good job of it, that, that'd be okay. It wouldn't, wouldn't be bad, that's for sure. China's the biggest e-commerce market in the world. They have the biggest name in the world in the uh, form of Alibaba, but a number of other players too. You know, uh, Yihao Dian is a joint venture with Walmart and plays a very important role, a number of other players. Um, it's, it's incredible. The thing that I think is important about a market like China is uh, when you think about e-commerce. First, from a consumer perspective, e-commerce is about choice. So if you're a consumer and you're in one of the lower tier cities in the center of the country, it's not Shanghai. So you go to your local store and you just don't have the variety and the choice and the offer in that particular store uh, that um, you might find in a, in a big giant city like Shanghai. But you go to the website, you go to your favorite e-com website and suddenly everything that, uh, that is available to somebody in Shanghai is now available to you. So this is a fantastic thing from a consumer's perspective. And it's one of the reasons why the consumers in these lower tier cities in China spend as much as a quarter of their discretionary income on e-commerce. It's an incredible, incredible amount of uh, their money that they're putting on e-com. Then if you're a marketer, what e-commerce does is it gives you um, an incredibly personal relationship with the buyer. The level of precision that you can then target a consumer, learn about that consumer's behavioral habits, build a, a, you know, a database really about consumers over time. It, it generates a, a completely different position for marketers. And then um, you know, the, the last thing is um, these e-commerce players themselves, a big company like, uh, like Alibaba, they don't think of themselves just as online retailers. They think of themselves as a marketing platform or even data platforms. And they see the opportunity to earn as much off of the, the data they have on consumers and um, helping people market to them more effectively as they do off the sale of the products themselves. And so I think it's going to be a very exciting future for e-commerce, not just in China, but throughout Asia and throughout the world. Vimal, one of the things people don't know about Africa is that it is less rural than you would think. It is more urbanized than India, uh, 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 urbanized about the, the same degree as China is. Uh, it's more banked than, than uh, you might expect. Uh, but Kenya gave birth to a remarkable payment system. And I remember hearing about years ago and thinking, well, okay, whatever, it's a way to use your phone to, to make payments. It's kind of the biggest thing around. It's become the gold standard in the world for uh, payments over, over phones and PESA. What, what role does that play in, in serving the middle class? Massive role. I think it's a massive role in a way. And can you tell us, for anybody who doesn't know, know about it, tell us a little about it. M-Pesa is basically you can transfer money from your phone. It's your wallet that's in your pocket right now. It becomes a virtual wallet. And your wallet becomes on your, comes on your phone. So if you want to send a payment to somebody, just send them an SMS and the money is transferred. The person who gets it can send money to 10 more people and they can settle all their bills sitting here, you know, doing nothing else except just sending it across. Now it leapfrogs. You mean, you mean after the panel, right? Yeah, we don't want them to do it right now. <laughs> right, don't yeah, make the payments the now. Yeah. So the point is, after that, they can pay all their bills straight away from wherever they are. Now that means leapfrogging from e-commerce. This is going to, again, plastic money leapfrogging from plastic money, because plastic money, you still got to go swipe and go to the store, or you can use it on, on, on internet. But this one does all your payments straight away. Now, settlement can be in cash if you want it. Otherwise, you keep on circling that money across the system. That makes m-commerce. So from e-commerce, we've, we've leapfrogged to m-commerce, mobile commerce. And from your mobile phone, you can do all your purchases, all your payments, everything online. Now that opens up a huge opportunity for, and I think that's where we're gonna, we're gonna leapfrog from your bricks and mortar store to say, fine, here we go in terms of um, you know, e-commerce. But the biggest problem there was, there are banks, but if your bank is 20 kilometers or five kilometers away in the branch and all that stuff, or if every store doesn't take on your cards. The other thing with cards is you've got a four or 5% uh, commission rate on, on your cards. M-Pesa leapfrogs that too. It's a simple, small amount. Uh, 
about two three percent, uh, not even two three percent, point three percent, point five percent sometimes of your transaction. So it's a simple simple cost. But the point is, there's no point of sale terminal necessary because everybody's you've got a society Romeo, where everybody's got a phone and it doesn't have to be a smartphone. Well, they call them uh, feature phones now. Yeah, feature phone, and, right? And feature phones about uh, thirty, forty, fifty dollars. Uh, per, per phone, but it's got internet connectivity. And internet also is available now on your phone. I think practically most of our people look at internet first time through the phone, not through the computers. So it's, it's really going to leapfrog a lot of things now. The question then is delivery systems. Your, your delivery system in terms of sending the cross, goods across your logistics. Huge amount of investment needs to be done in transportation, logistics across the region. Right, it's easy manner. enough that I can pay for something, but I need to get it. Yes. So if you do, if you you do your purchases straight online, you got to then have those transport systems, delivery systems. Right. That's what people like us do right now, and we do that through M Commerce. It also links up completely to your accounting system, so it's all seamlessly done. So your transaction cost for even smaller transactions is very, very low, and that's how you actually attack the And this is the spreading room. across Africa. M-Pesa has been uh, something that's... Not that's all across. Eastern Africa mainly, but uh, other countries, I think the banks are still looking at regulation. A lot of people talk about how do we regulate this because the banks are the biggest hindrance. Even in the U.S., I think the banking industry would say, hey, mm. this is going to cut us out. Right, you get them at individual banks, but you don't have an across. You know, you've got, got PayPal, you've got... But it's, it's, not. it's the regulators that spoil yeah. the whole show, so... That's the biggest issue there. Let me, uh, let me ask you, one of the things I think, I, I believe I'm uh, attributing to you, but I think I read you talking about that in some cases, getting into and being able to successfully uh, execute in an emerging market may involve some infrastructure commitment. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think part of uh, what we're recognizing is one of the, you know, one of the greatest limitations to growth for us in, in a lot of developing markets is the, the readiness or the infrastructure that, that surrounds it, especially when you talk about route to market. Although I do agree that this opportunity um, to, to find the right partners that can uh, match up with what uh, your whatever varied routes look like. You know, India jumping big box stores directly to e-commerce is a reality that, that's going to happen. So the opportunity to begin to invest in things other than just traditional marketing and traditional business is part of what we're looking at. More and more, the opportunity to um, to have a good portion of our external strategy targeting uh, infrastructure where we can invest, uh, purchase, um, build together is a, is a much better formula for success for us. Um, I think there's, there's also a greater understanding uh, going back to this competition with local players. Um, you know, one of the things we can bring to bear in a way that a lot of local brands and local businesses do is providing the same community involvement that a lot of local companies do. So our ability to come in and set up infrastructure around education. You know, one of the things that we talk a lot about in Mondelez is we should be the best developer of young marketing talent in any country that we go to. What that means is investing in both what our training programs are, but local educational programs as well. We're a food company, so understanding the nutritional needs of the markets that we're in is an incredibly important part of building brands and building businesses in these developing markets, where in the past we may have looked at it a little bit more opportunistically. Where can we sell? Where are we at the right point of penetration um, to make a business at critical Critical mass. Now we understand that we've got to build that over time. Uh, one of the one of the programs that we're that we're proudest of is a program called Coco Life, which is targeting um, uh, cocoa farmers in Africa, uh, with a specific focus on. Uh, women that are farmers that are able to build their own businesses through development, education, and then a model uh, and technology that allows them to dramatically change the yield on their crops. It solves an opportunity or an issue or challenge for us, which is local sourcing, but it also provides a footprint in the geography uh, that's recognizable for us as a company and also is helping build that, that infrastructure that we're talking about. So it's trickier. It's more holistic now than it used to be. I think it's such an important point, by the way. In China in particular, lately the government's made it a little bit harder on the global firms and tilted the playing field maybe more towards the local players. Um, I heard Eric Schmidt say, though, that um, you can still be successful in China if you're a global firm, but you have to recognize that you need to be useful to China yeah. mm -hmm. in order for that to happen. And uh, this concept of shared value, which 
sounds a lot like uh, what you just talked about, Mark. I think it's very important. Yeah. I, uh, I, I, I've forgotten to actually stop and ask you uh, if you have questions here. I'm enjoying this conversation so much. Uh, so we do have a mic here. Um, let me see. Megan's at the back there. And there's a question right uh, there. Yeah, just put your hand up, and you're welcome to put it up while somebody else is talking, and I'll just, I'll just uh, keep an eye out for you. Please, sir, stand up and give, give us your name. Uh, Rehan with uh, EJF Capital. Can, can the panel spend a little bit more time on infrastructure connecting end-demand e-commerce Maybe some specific examples I can visualize how the delivery happens, um, mobile or e-commerce, whatever happens there. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, I can start. Uh, one of the things when we talk about infrastructure is, as you might imagine, uh, there, is, there is more and more of a need as you start to leave urban centers and expand your business across other geographies. I, I talk about India, for example. Today, in India, we cover a million outlets uh, with Cadbury chocolate in our portfolio in India. There are seven million outlets in India. So one of the things that we're trying to do is to start to create partnerships with local supply chain and distributors and investing in their capabilities locally, where in the past we may have waited for someone to develop the capability. Now we're able to take the blueprint with the right kind of investment and the systems and support um, and be able to go uh, together. Or in some cases, we find um, well-developed, you know, incredibly sophisticated local players that maybe are not in competitive segments with us uh, that have the opportunity. Proposal, right? That have the opportunity. <laughs> this is uh, they tell you business right. gets done so at this conference. Let's take it in the back. Uh, that, that has the opportunity to, to utilize uh, that investment and, and network together. So that, that's, a, that's a simple example, but more and more that's ha now apply that to manufacturing. You know, the idea that we're going to build these mega factories to supply the world isn't as practical as it might have been in the past. So finding small modular facilities that allow us to make the products closer to where the consumers are and then doing it in a way where we can uh, fit with uh, other players or other manufacturers is, is a big idea and one that uh, I think we're just beginning to scratch the surface on. One of the things that um I was studying about Africa is that the the penetration in certain retail sectors of chain stores is very very low branded stores is very low uh, uh, informal uh, businesses same thing in India very very high so this becomes an issue of distribution. But they're coming in now. I mean, modern trade, that's what we call it. Modern trade is now coming in. We've got uh, our locals, Nakamat, Tuskies, Navas, but we've got Carrefour and we've got Massmart through Walmart coming in right now into, into East Africa. But having said that, still, modern trade is still 20% of total uh, transactions. People still go to the shop, kiosk or whatever in terms of convenience buying. Now, it depends on how people are paid. Some people are paid daily, some people are paid weekly, monthly, or, or you know, monthly, that's the last, last one. So whenever they're paid, they actually visit the supermarkets or they visit the kiosk. The other thing is what we do in terms of linking the whole supply chain and route to market is we have uh, mobile commerce now. We've also got hubs and spokes across the region. So what happens there is we've computerized them all. They're all on real-time online basis. Therefore, we get secondary sales all the time. We know about 70,000 outlets. We know exactly what they're stocking every day. Along with this, we've got logistics. So logistics is your entire supply chain of deliveries. Now, we've outsourced that to a, a, an own operated DHL type of operation where they actually deliver to wherever the order comes from. So the order is coming in through mobile commerce. We get the order in. This is retail orders. No, or, or this is trade. This is oh, business trade. to business. Okay. All right. This is not retail. It's not Got a it. consumer saying, I want two packs. Yeah. This is the trade. So the trade actually asks for the product in the last mile system, and then we deliver through, through the mobile, through the, through the DHL type of system. And therefore, your supply chain becomes faster. Um, there's not, it's not difficult to get your supply chain tighter and get things organized. Um, I think logistics across the, the region in, in Africa is improving. A lot of infrastructure investments are going in. But a lot of the rural, rural, right, is becoming different. There's, there's, that's where you operate a hub and spoke, where you've got certain sectors where people deliver from your hubs and spokes. So it's not as easy as what you have in the US, where you have a big store and all that stuff, but you've got to work through a different system. Now, combining technology, combining logistics, combining your supply chains, and faster, faster communication. Um, I think the whole era, and I think I love that the multinationals are now thinking differently and localizing, uh, global thinking, but local application. 
Uh, it comes in handy because what happens now is you've got to go nearer to where the products are being uh, consumed. And therefore, you're going to make them much more better for them. Um, again, third party operations uh, where people manufacture for you, that's also coming into place. But at the same time, I think a lot of Africa has been exporting a lot of its raw products to be processed in the West. And it is, it's coming back with finished products. It needs to sort it out yeah. differently and say, find the raw material, finished product from the same side, and intra trade. Other questions out there? Do you have a, I didn't ask you guys, do you somebody have a view on this particular, uh, this particular, oh wow, yes. there's somebody right uh, there. Hi, Lights, um, right in the this, spotlight. This question is for Mitch. Um, what is Nielsen uh, doing to uh, track the global consumer and what are some of the challenges in, in doing that? Well, um, what we do is we measure consumers, both what they watch, um, so that's media consumption, whether it's television or digital, and then what they buy. We do that at a local level. And then we do it in such a way that allows us to give a regional or a global view to our clients who are interested in doing so. And that's in particular of interest to the big uh, global consumer packaged goods companies, not so much of interest to the big media companies, because media still is very much a local business. With the exception of if you're Google or if you're Facebook, they want to have a much more global view around the world. Um, so again, we build our business up country by country around the world, but try to do it in a consistent way that allows us to piece it together and, and give um, consistent global views. And that's especially important for the big global firms. Something that uh, Vimal uh, uh, mentioned earlier is uh, in competing in these growth markets, uh, one of the things that companies have to do is be very, very sensitive to the, the differences. I mean, in, in, you mentioned in America we've got some emerging markets, but there's sort of a pattern of, of what marketing to an American looks like, at least regionally. Uh, what are the best methods for companies to, to, to market their, their goods and services? You mean in terms of understanding in, the in diversity market, right, in the marketplace? Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's, it's good old-fashioned blocking and tackling. Uh, you know, it's about understanding the market as broadly as you can, focusing in on then what are the key segments, what's the profit potential of each of those segments, and then prioritizing what you do around those um, segments with the most potential. It's a best practice that uh, most companies um, already apply. Um, they need to keep it fresh, and they need to be as efficient with it as they possibly can. Um, you know, the key, though, right now is the pace of change in the marketplace is incredible. And it'll probably be, this is probably the slowest change will be for the rest of our lives. You know, the reality is, uh, but it, it's just accelerating. And, you know, just a mobile phone, for example, we talked about that a, mo a moment ago, 5 billion mobile phones in the world, 2 billion of them are smart, smartphones, but that's doubled in just the past three years. And that smartphone in the hands of consumers is totally changing the game. Um, you know, more emails were open on a smart, on a, on a mobile phone last year than on a computer for the first time in history. And it'll never be different again. You know, mobile phone will dominate the way consumers shop, the way they get information. Um, you know, it's, it's really a, an incredible pace of change out there in the marketplace right now. So you can't be overwhelmed by all that. You still have to focus in on the basics about segmenting the market, focusing in on um, the highest profit potential segments, and, um, and then organizing yourself around those. What a remarkable conversation. We're, uh, we're just about out of time. Uh, so I want to thank our, our panelists for being here for your very, very different perspectives. Um, nothing like that when we can have four people uh, here who are, are, are in some cases agreeing with each other or disagreeing, but at least bringing entirely different perspectives about something that we're all going to face uh, and, we're, and it's happening right now. So thank you so much uh, for being here to all of you and thank you to all of you uh, for being here and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Grab some Oreos uh, as soon as you can. I'm going to. Thank you, everybody. All right.